place with changing our minds we organize and build power through our minds we mentally envision first and physically we'll see that having racial equity will empower DC. It's never been a peaceful revolution. Knowing thyself is the solution. Water me down says confusion. No more statistics, facts are proven. Everything though comes to an conclusion. Ending the process of misusing. Ending believing in illusion. For a minute, let's change with the truism. Let's rebel for a minute. Let's go. Prevail for a minute. Be bold for a minute. Let the truth be told for a minute. Time to disrupt for a minute. Not all about money for a minute. Uh, but be willing for a minute. Do right by the people for a minute. Time to go hard for a minute. Uh, time to ride for a minute. Uh, time to slide for a minute. Uh, time to know for a minute. No, we are gods for a minute. Uh, we in charge for a minute. We've been here for a minute. Uh, we've been ready for a minute. Ready to heal for a minute. Ready to build for a minute. Uh, to empower for a minute. To go get it for a minute. Let's pull it together for a minute. By sticking together for a minute. Doing it together for a minute. By using our minds for a minute. Empower DC, though. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Racial equity in DC is the topic. Though DC natives are soul chanting people over profit. The chant is powerful, but will the chant stop it? My apartment is filled with lead, while I have been led to believe that. While I apply for the same position, that the decision was not based on my dreads. My skin tone, my high cheekbones, my unattended soul seat. Racial inequity speaks to me deeply. Cause that's the seed they planted in me when they tease me. And dangle in my face new businesses, new condos that's coming pronto. But still so much homelessness though. Now we rise with change in our minds. We organize and build power through our minds. We mentally envision first and physically we'll see that. Having racial equity will empower DC. It's never been a peaceful revolution. Knowing thyself is the solution. Water me down says confusion. No more statistics, facts are proven. Everything though comes to an conclusion. Ending the process of misusing. Ending believing in illusion. For a minute, let's change with the truism. Let's rebel for a minute. Let's go. Prevail for a minute. Be bold for a minute. Let the truth be told for a minute. Time to disrupt for a minute. Not all about money for a minute. Uh, but be willing for a minute. Do right by the people for a minute. Time to go hard for a minute. Uh, time to ride for a minute. Uh, time to slide for a minute. Uh, time to know for a minute. No, we are gods for a minute. Uh, we in charge for a minute. We've been here for a minute. Uh, We've been ready for a minute. Ready to heal for a minute. Ready to build for a minute. To empower for a minute, to go get it for a minute. Let's pull it together for a minute. By sticking together for a minute, doing it together for a minute. By using our minds for a minute. Afternoon, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for joining today. My name is Parisa Naruzi. I'm director of Empower DC. And this is our monthly meeting of the DC Grassroots Planning Coalition. Um, today, we're going to really get into the implementation of the racial equity policies that were uh, incorporated into the comprehensive plan. Um, I want to uh, invite everybody to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, if you can, share your neighborhood or ward that helps people connect with each other. And this, this has been one of the functions of these meetings over the last four plus years is to um, uh, facilitate that kind of shared learning and, and solidarity among uh, different neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, I don't know if we have any people uh, today who are brand new to these meetings, but uh, I'll just give a very, very brief overview, which is that uh, we did start in spring of 2017. Um, to hold these meetings and, and work together to push for uh, racially equitable community-led development. 
Uh, we want to stop the displacement of black and brown residents from our city. We want to repair harm that's been done over decades of racist policies, uh, especially land use and housing policies. And we saw the um, comprehensive plan as a key opportunity to do some of that work. The comprehensive plan is the overarching guiding framework for development in the city. And the city council was uh, embarking on the process of amending the plan. Um, so uh, for, for several years, we all and many of you here engage engaged in that work. And in May of this year, the city council passed uh, a, a, an amended version of the comprehensive plan that did incorporate um, a, several of our um, you know, policy objectives. And uh, the work that we're gonna talk about today primarily is the uh, policies that require racial equity lens incorporated into uh, city planning and zoning. Um, so I'm going to share just a couple of slides and we're going to get into, um, you know, the, the, the work today, but just in short, we're very concerned that we have not seen meaningful implementation of these new racial equity policies. And that's really why we're gathered today is to um, get together collectively uh, and, and commit to some action to push this because without our effort, it wouldn't have been in the comp plan to begin with. And without our effort, it won't be uh, meaningfully implemented. Um, so, so again, this is our purpose is to ensure that the racial equity uh, policies in the comp plan are meaningfully in, uh, implemented in a way that really impacts the outcome, not just buzzwords, not just, you know, symbolic stuff, but really stops the displacement of black and brown residents and repairs the harm that has been done. And just to set the tone a little bit, there's two key policies that were passed by the council over the last year and a half or so that affect racial equity. The Racial Equity Achieves Results Act or the REACH Act uh, established two new agencies in the city. The Council Office of Racial Equity, which is led by Dr. Brian McClure, um, that agency is responsible for reviewing council legislation using a racial equity impact analysis. And they post those uh, assessments uh, on their website, dcracialequity.org, so you can take a look at them. The first one that the agency did was actually of the comprehensive plan, and it, it actually did um, call attention to many of the concerns that we have and continue to have about how uh, some of the changes in land use in the comp plan uh, exacerbate or have the potential to exacerbate racial inequity. Um, the second uh, agency established by the REACH Act is the Office of Racial Equity under the mayor's office. It actually comes, it sits under the city administrator and it's led by Dr. Amber Hewitt, who is our city's first chief equity officer. That agency is responsible for providing racial equity training to DC government agencies and staff, creating racial equity uh, plans and um, goals for agencies, as well as uh, creating a tool, racial equity tools for the different agencies to use. Uh, one of the things that the agency has done recently is release a draft of a community engagement guide that they will be working to finalize and use as a guide for DC government agencies to engage in meaningful, racially equitable community engagement. We had a meeting with um, Amber Hewitt a couple weeks ago about that. And if you missed it, you can look at the uh, YouTube slash Empower DC, the Empower DC channel on YouTube, and you can see a recording of that. And then the the second piece of, of course is the DC comprehensive plan. As I mentioned, amended earlier this year after four plus years now requires a racial equity lens in city planning and zoning and specifically mentions use of that racial equity analysis in many, many policies throughout the plan, including in small area plans, which are you know, conducted by the office of planning in transportation planning, industrial land use, housing analysis, workforce development, capital planning, so when the city is looking at its own facilities and many other areas. 
So just to be on the same page, this is what the, the comprehensive plan says is the definition of racial equity. Um, they, I think, borrowed a lot of this language from uh, Race Forward, which is a national uh, national organization, and, and its um, affiliate GARE, Government Alliance for Racial Equity, which involves a number of city governments from across the country in doing this racial equity work. So you could look at um, GARE and uh, Race Forward for trainings, for tools and resources. Um, but it does you know, talk about, and this is in the framework element of the comp plan, which is the first chapter was actually finalized in 2018. And it talks about racial equity as the moment when, when race can no longer be used to, to predict life outcomes. Um, the, the thing that I think is most important here in, in part is the process part. So it's not just an outcome, and it's, but, but a process and you know, recognizing, and I think we all recognize this, that you can't have an equitable outcome if you don't have an equitable process. So how you start really predicts how you finish, right? And as a process here, um, it says apply a racial equity lens uh, when those, it means that those most impacted by structural racism are meaningfully involved in the creation and implementation of the institutional policies and practices that impact their lives. So it's not just, hey, we're well-meaning, we're going to, you know, this is going to be good for people, but we're actually going to involve the people impacted in the creation of the policy and in the implementation of the policy. And that's a key thing that we're not seeing here in, in the city yet. There's another, um, a little more information in the, in the implementation um, chapter of the comp plan. And, and we actually pushed for this because this comp plan was calling for a racial equity lens, yet that had not been defined. So the definition was added um, and it, it, it guides somewhat the creation of the racial equity tools that would create a racial equity lens. So identifying and considering past and current systemic racial inequities, identifying who benefits or is burdened from a decision disaggregating data by race and analyzing data, considering different impacts and outcomes by race, and uh, evaluating the program activity or decisions to identify measures that reduce systemic racial inequities, eliminate race as a predictor of results, and promote equitable development outcomes. So again, I, I think this is a fairly good standard, uh, yet, you know, as a starting point, yet we have not seen anything yet to actually implement this. And in fact, we've seen the planning office and the zoning commission take actions uh, that do the opposite <laughs> of this since this was implemented. Um, and just you know, this is a couple of the policies uh, that also in the comp plan spell out um, the use of the racial equity tools and the training. Um, and, you know, in this first one, the last sentence, this shall specifically include a process for the zoning commission to evaluate all actions through a racial equity lens as part of its comprehensive plan consistency analysis. And so what we're blowing the whistle on today is that in the case of Berry Farm, in the case of Park Morton, which we're going to hear more about today, the zoning commission has moved forward with major zoning changes without any implementation of this racial equity lens whatsoever. So as I mentioned, Berry Farm was actually the first case uh, right after the comp plan was uh, um, finalized by the council. The zoning commission had a hearing to um, change the maps, the zoning maps for Berry Farm to facilitate the redevelopment. Um, but within that had no racial equity analysis and we pushed for as one piece of a racially equitable outcome to include a guaranteed right to return for displaced residents in the zoning order and they refused they said that that was out of their purview however our pushback is well I thought we were doing things differently now right I thought we weren't going to keep doing them the way we've been doing them that has resulted in the displacement of at least 50,000, 60,000 black residents from our city since 2000. So if that's the case, we have to you know, see these things reflected in the zoning orders. 
Um, Zoning Commission is poised to do the same with Park Morton. And in this meeting today, we will hear uh, more about that. Um, there have been members of this group who have met with Office of Planning. In fact, uh, in fact, Andrew Trueblood, Director of Office of Planning, met with this group at the monthly meeting a few months ago. That video is also on the YouTube channel and really did not articulate really even an idea of what how they were going to implement this racial equity lens in subsequent meetings um, with residents from Ivy City and, and Ward 3 residents. We've heard the same lack of vision lack of plan for what they're going to do, even a proposal for what they might do. And also uh, the tools that would be required um, by the comp plan to implement the racial equity lens have not yet been completed uh, by the Office of Racial Equity. So in several ways, you know, we're seeing the city continue business as usual. And really with without our focus on this, they will do that. We're going to have to really call attention and push. Just yesterday, um, the Council Office of Racial Equity released a new racial equity impact assessment. It's of the um, resolution that the Council is considering for adopting the new comprehensive plan maps. And within that assessment, the, the DC Corps does reflect our concern here again that the racial equity lens has not been implemented. Um, so uh, yeah, so here's the quote <laughs> from that document. But again, this council office is agreeing with us. You know, the council office of racial equity is agreeing with us that there appears to be no meaningful implementation of this important key policy. So today we're gonna um, we're gonna learn about this in the context of Park Morton and the efforts to ensure racial equity and the redevelopment of that public housing community. We're gonna hear just a little bit about what other cities are doing on this. And then we're gonna talk about our priorities for racial equity implementation in planning and zoning and commit to some action steps. And I think with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to William Jordan, who is um, a member of the steering committee of the Grassroots Planning Coalition. Let me... William, I think make you co-host so that I think you might have slides to share. And yeah, and he's gonna share with us uh, what's happening with Park Morton. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is William Jordan. I'm part of the Park Morton equity team. So just for a quick background, um, um, Park Morton is a public housing project in Northwest Washington, D.C., off of Georgia Avenue. Uh, the, that property is a, was originally 174 units, and back in 2006, it was entered in the city's new communities program. Um, in 2014, the city pulled the plug on the original new communities uh, program, rebid the site and picked a new developer. Uh, fast forward to today, that new developer uh, since 2014 has produced no units of housing. They have not met the bill first requirement, which was a big deal for new communities is that you build units first in order to avoid displacement of residents. And then you continue on and that way, most residents never really leave the property and then you know they will have the right to return to their new community, which has been a big flaw in all of these different uh, Hope Six and Choice Neighborhood and all the projects up to today is that at the end of the day, residents end up being displaced, and that wasn't supposed to happen uh, in this case. Um, so the current state of the property now is that when this project restarted in 2014, there was about 133 families on the property. Uh, today, there are 20. Most of the families were displaced during the pandemic year and a half. So 
the housing authority used the pandemic as a cover to go in and displace residents when most other areas were designed to prevent people from being moved during that time. Um, so Park Morton is connected to two zoning commission orders. So this is where we get down to our racial equity piece. There are two zoning commission orders. There's one that's 1611, which you may know as the Bruce Monroe site, it used to be a school that the city tore down, and 1612, which is Park Morton itself. The city designed a program that would move 90 of the 130 something resident families to Bruce Monroe about a half mile down the street and keep the rest on site. Uh, so that technically violated the promise made to residents that all residents would be able to return to the Park Morton site and that down the street. The residents were also told that in the interim, should you have to move, we'll find a place for you in the neighborhood in Ward 1, uh, at, at worst Ward 1. Um, to date of the 100 and probably 20 families that have been displaced, only 20 landed in Ward 1. Just about all the other families are scattered across the city and some are in Maryland. So there was no, I mean, it was totally botched. Currently, um, the site, this, the housing authority is what we always refer to as, as Barry Farming Park Morton, which is basically they're emptying residents and about to go into demolition to tear down the site in order to lock in their leverage. Because if the residents are gone, they can basically do whatever they want to do. If the residents are there, even though they will fight resident rights, they still have to, res to recognize the rights of residents. Um, Park Morton uh, families are probably 80 something to 90% headed by black women. Um, and those women have decided back in 2000, 18, 19 under Ms. High, who's the president of the resident council, that they were gonna fight for equity. So their position moving forward was the city's program was stuck. It was stuck in court battles and funding battles. They always point to the courts, but in Berry Farm, as well as Park Morton, DENPED never allocated all of the gap funding. So even if there were no court cases, there was no funding to move the project forward. But they always blame and use the courts as an excuse as to why things weren't moving forward. But if you check the budgets, for example, the two projects at Park Morton had a $97 million funding gap that DENPED was responsible for. Never in DENPED's capital budget for Park Morton, had there been over a million dollars allocated for the entire project. They just put in 38 million this past summer. So up until this summer, there was no funding to do anything for the project. Um, so the, so those two PUDs, so Bruce Monroe ended up uh, coming before the zoning commission, they were approved and a group of neighbors sued on the Bruce Monroe site and it went to court. The court looked at the city's PUD, the zoning commission order and remanded it back. They vacated it and remanded it back to the zoning commission to go back and basically provide further explanation, right? Because the zoning commission just rubber stamps whatever the developers say and send it on to the courts. And the courts have always said that if you just copy, which they did in this case, what the developer says, and the developer in this case is both a private developer and the city working together. So this is where 
Berry Farm, and these projects are really unique. It's that it's the developer, which was a private entity, backed by the city, right? So they're in it together. There's no accountability. Normally, when there's a contract with the city, the city oversees the contract. But if the city is the partner with the developer, there is no oversight except for the residents and those of us in the public who provide oversight. The Zoning Commission, which is supposed to operate independently, is supposed to review these projects and determine whether the benefits significantly outweigh the adverse impacts of the project. Right. So, and that's what the Zoning Commission is supposed to evaluate. The Zoning Commission, instead of doing that kind of independent evaluation, meaning getting reports in, doing an analysis, looking at the project, basically says, we don't have to do that. If the city says it needs to move forward, it moves forward. And the courts say, no, you can't do that. You have to actually look at things. So in the case of Park Morton, the Zoning Commission had its order remanded and it decided they were going to review the project before sending it back to the courts. The Zoning Commission decided they could have just sent it back using the old comp plan as its basis and not have to address racial equity as we know it. They could have just said, we're using the old rules, the old comp plan, put some explanation and send it back to the courts for further review. But because the new comp plan included new zoning maps, language changes, and things that would, in theory, make it easier for them to get it passed to the courts, they decided to respond, or at least they told us they just decided to respond under the new comp plan. But luckily, due to the work of Empower DC and the grassroots planning and those of you out there, that new process also includes a racial equity analysis requirement for the comp plan. And so, and for this particular PUD, so they took that path. And so it was on the 10th of, 19th of October, there was a hearing before the Zoning Commission to review the Park Morton Bruce Monroe PUD. And at that, hearing, they wanted us to, when I say us, the resident council, the developer, and the other party, community party that would file the lawsuit to reevaluate the zoning order based on the new comp plan. And so, which for us meant, we argued that you have to use a racial equity analysis in evaluating the PUD. The problem is the Zoning Commission has no history and has no tool to do a racial equity analysis. So that was the heart of the debate back and forth. And so in the back and forth, OP, the Office of Planning, came forward and said, they should have said the zoning commission should improve the, approve the PUD the way it is. And we asked the zoning commission, did you use a racial equity analysis in your new decision? They said, yes. We asked them, can you please show us your racial equity tool that you use to use your racial equity analysis? And their response is, we ain't got one. Well, first they said, bah, 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 Then they finally said, we ain't got one. So we asked, how can you do a racial equity lens analysis if you don't have a tool? And they said, we can do it just because. And we went back and forth. And then the zoning commission asked us to move on because they said, basically, obviously, they didn't use a tool. They just made it up. Um, similarly, we asked those same questions to the development team. We actually couldn't cross them, but um, 
The development team basically came back in their response and said the same thing. Um, you, we don't have to use a racial equity tool we, to do a racial equity analysis. We just know it. We just kind of know. We it's us. We're smart, you know. And so, after going back and forth, the zoning commission, since it didn't have a tool, asked the resident council at Park Morton to provide them with a tool. So not only didn't they not have a tool, they asked the least resource party to provide them with a tool in order to do a racial equity analysis. So we did that. We took on the challenge. We created a tool. We used a lot of what the DC Council uh, core office used um, to do a model and we submitted that tool back to the Zoning Commission on, and we submitted that back on October 26th. And on November 11th, no, on November 18th, the Zoning Commission is gonna have a hearing where they're gonna share their response. And their response will be one of the first times where they actually are going to respond to what they view racial equity. Either they're going to ignore our submission or they're going to rule on racial equity. Now, the goal is of the racial equity analysis is, as the definition says, is that you have to look at it from the perspective of not just the overall project, but those who have been impacted by racial inequities and institutional racism, et cetera. So from the standpoint of the residents, we argue you have to do an analysis. And the analysis from our argument is that the adverse impacts of the displacement and the lack of amenities and all of the things that the PUDs and NCI has done does not make up for the harm, the benefits of a few affordable housing units that replace the affordable housing units they already had, right? So there's really no benefit. If, I, if you have affordable housing, they displace you and jerk you around for 12 years and give you affordable housing when you come back, there's no benefit. However, you've gone through hell in the meantime, which is an adverse impact, and that has to be considered. And so that's really, if those two things don't balance out positively, then there is no legitimate PUD because the PUD has to show significant benefit that outweigh the public thing. So on the 18th of this month, the Zoning Commission is going to have a hearing and we'll hear back from them. And that will be, we will find out one, did they in the interim come up with their own racial equity tool? Did they use our racial equity tool? And will they show their homework? Because the whole purpose of a racial equity tool is you have to show your homework. You can't just say, we use a racial equity lens and came to this conclusion. They have to go, who does this project benefit? How do they benefit? and base that on reports and analysis of the project. You can't just say, I said it so, because OP said it so. You have to show your homework, and we're going to find out whether they show the homework on the 11th. So I would suggest everyone put on their calendar, I think it's at 4 on November 18th, and be prepared for war if they come back with the same dribble that they usually come back with um, on this racial equity piece. The second step, of course, will be, depending on what they say, they may have a new hearing or they may write their PUD order and just send it back to the courts. And depending on that, we'll have to decide whether to take how we respond to the courts uh, from there, and if we can, and what our jurisdiction is. So I think one of the most important things we're about to find out is 
does racial equity have any teeth on the 18th? And so I'll close out by saying, again, there's nothing in this comp plan that says if we find, or in the law, if we find this policy racist, you can't move forward with it. So racial equity and the lens and all those kind of things don't stop you from continuing with racist policies, with displacement. The only thing it really does say from my understanding is you have to admit it, right? You have to write it down. And then it's up to us to decide whether we want to accept that the Zoning Commission will say, yes, this has a negative racial impact. This is harmful to these people, but because these people don't matter when it comes to comparison with the growth and development, 36,000 new housing and et cetera, um, we can move forward. And so then it's a political issue of what are we gonna do if we have on our record, and I think this is what's gonna happen on the, on the 18th. The zoning commission is gonna rubber stamp this project and it's gonna say, yes, there are racial inequities here, but it doesn't matter because those people aren't that important to our larger policy of bringing more upper income whites into the city is outweighed. And therefore we have to do this for the city survival. We must displace is requirement for our, the economic survival of the city. And they will put that in writing. And then what do we do when it becomes clear that there's no gray area anymore of what the city's policies are? So I'll take any questions, but you know, I tried to sum it in a nutshell. And again, look for the ruling on the 18th and be prepared for how we respond to things on the 18th. Thank you, um, William. Just one quick question before I take a couple hands. The, uh, the hearing on the 18th, is there public uh, testimony at that hearing? I don't think there's public testimony. It's a public hearing, but I don't think they're testimony. They weren't clear uh, and they haven't told us that there would be testimony. I'm going to ask uh, any questions or comments right now be brief because um, we are going to have more time in a little bit to discuss this uh, more fully. Michael Pan, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, so I have a question. Yes, so although the Zoning Commission uh, was created to address racial equity, and after you listen, you know, very carefully what, uh, what you said, to be honest, the Zoning Commission was not really created by local residents, and it's a cover-up. It's actually created by Mazungus, who are telling the council members, no, telling council members indirectly, no, you can't, you can't, you can't, um, you can't build for housing, affordable housing for black, brown communities. So they want them to do is replace the brown communities with Mazungus, because they know Mazungus have a lot of money, power, and wealth to control these, to control DC. It also leads back to the Black Wall Street of the, I'm sorry, the, the Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, riots that happen exactly, and it's happening today in the present. So, like with the zoning commission, it's it's no, I don't see any use because it's not going to tell, it's not going to, it's not going to force developers to cooperate. Yes. To <laughs> Jerry, did you like to do it? Thank you for that. Um, I agree that the zoning commission was not created. <laughs> for the support of DC residents. And in fact, you know, the whole history of zoning is, uh, was originated in racist policymaking. Um, so yeah, well, there's, a, there's a lot, uh, and there were some comments in the chat about um, the, Sharice Muhammad was pointing out the composition of the zoning commission being primarily appointed by the mayor so that, you know, there's a tight political connection there. And then there's a couple representatives that are actually federal um, representative. So there's really no um, apparatus there that's reflective of the people who are most impacted. Um, and when you were talking, William, it reminded me of, of uh, when years ago we were fighting the closure of public schools, when the city closed 40 plus schools impacting only black children, literally. And we went to court and the, the white judge said, 
Well, you mean to tell me that the black uh, mayor and the black school chancellor are racist? They're discriminating against black children? And the whole courtroom said, yes, you know, but their analysis was, oh, this is good for black people. This is good for black children. We're gonna close these schools. We're gonna, you know, reform the schools. And the, the, the key factor is who's making the decision? If the people impacted are not making the decision, then it's it's going to likely be politicized. It's going to be you know reflecting uh, you know these power the, the, the power is not being redistributed. In other words, so if we talk about racial equity and decisions like uh, Park Morton, we're not going to be able to have an equitable outcome until we redistribute the decision making power around these. Uh, you know, these decisions, as well as the resources themselves, the, the financial, the, the money, the land. We're not repairing anything, as William was saying, by just giving a, another uh, replacement housing unit when we displaced you 12 years ago from your housing unit. That's not that's not actually, you know, coming, repairing past harm. We'll take a couple of uh, comments, but then we do want to go to the next yeah, section. Yeah, I want to respond to say this, you know, whether, you know, this theoretically, we still are a society of law, right? And so they have to, it doesn't matter. They still have to follow their own rules or at least be called to account to follow their own rules. But ultimately, just as what they've done with the comp plan, they attempted to change the rules, right? So when the courts told them to, you have to explain why and how you're making these decisions, right? The city, rather than respond, is explain themselves because they can't, right? They can't. So they change the rules to say, we don't have to explain ourselves, right? And so when, but ultimately they still have to answer to us. The way they get away with this, the reason the zoning commission doesn't act independently is because we allow it. So I think the benefit of all of this is that many of us, just I think as Parisa said with the school system, don't want to believe that this progressive liberal city is, there's a book I just got called Nice Racism, right? Is as racist as, Jim Crow South, that white privilege is too powerful a force for them to let go of. And blacks are influenced by that same thing. So it doesn't matter who you are, it's systematic. Even the comp plan and what the core talks about is not individuals, it's the systematic nature of all of this. And so that's, so it really doesn't matter. We have to fight and that's just our job. Briefly. I always get that caveat. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I would like to, to thank uh, William uh, and, and all of the uh, residents and leaders of, of Park Morton. This is incredible what you all have done. And this is an exercise and liberation that I've, uh, it, it's, it's rare to see the persistence uh, and, and so my hat's off to, to all of you. Uh, the comment that I'd like to make is around this notion. So uh, William, you mentioned sort of systems operating together codependently to perpetuate racial inequity. As we have other discussions uh, about say, for example, reparations, I wonder whether or not we really can rely on those same systems to really repair the damage in a way that's needed, or rather we should really be looking for the government, for example, to give us money, say for a legal defense fund. And we fight these battles. Because right now, of course, we know that you all are absorbing a lot of these costs. Uh, and maybe maybe we just need the money to fight against the system. Uh, so I, I was wondering if, uh, if you were interested in, in uh, relating you all struggle with uh, the, the broader conversation around reparations or other uh, reparative uh, legislation. And I will say, yes. So the Park Morton um, resident council, 
Shanta High, Shanta High, right, created the Park Morton Equity Plan, right? And if you go through the Park Morton Equity Plan, in essence, what it says is we want one third of the property carved out and given to the residents, as well as one third of all the resources that Dimplet, Ped, and everybody else have pledged to go to the resident. And the Housing Authority has what they call a resident management corporation, which allows residents to self-manage. And we've asked for money for capacity building to be placed in that entity. All of these things are within the purview of the Housing Authority, the city and the city council to make happen. And so what has occurred in this particular case is because we have, under her Ms. High's leadership, we've only asked for the tools that have already have a precedent for existing. So we really haven't asked for anything that's out of the box yet. We will, but we have not. The, what has occurred is that as we've pushed forward for the last three years to make these things happen, um, Councilwoman Nadeau came in and tied DEMPAD's funding to the zoning order. So this creates a very interesting dynamic. The zoning commission says, we have no responsibility for the political stuff for the development stuff, just the land use stuff. However, the budget says the money has to go through the zoning commission's order. So the city has passed the responsibility for this project to the zoning commission and forced its hand. Now it does have responsibility for relocation, evaluate, at least evaluating relocation, evaluating funding. In fact, the comp, new comp plan says that you're supposed to look at if the city and the developer is proposing something, you have to check to make sure the funding is actually there to make it happen. So they've really luckily boxed us in the box, but they've boxed themselves in at the same time. So to your point, I will say, yes, this will determine whether the zoning commission has to address more or less reparations in a different name. So uh, that is our intent here. We couldn't hear you. Please. Uh, just saying, Jean, saying, Jean Stewart, your question. Hi, um, last Saturday, I virtually joined um, an action at Benning Terrace with Benning Terrace residents and featuring the fairly new director of the Housing Authority, um, uh, Brenda Donald. And she sounded, she talked a wonderful game. I have no idea whether there's substance behind um, what she's saying about an end to displacement and build first and uh, before you start displacing people, et cetera. And I'd love to hear from people who may have had um, interactions with Director Donald, uh, what your views are and whether um, this is a good change from terrible directors. <laughs> So let me tell you that we have, we are engaged in the Park Morton Equity Plan, which is what we've discussed with Director Donald. Um, she's asked us for an updated version of the plan and we sent it to her. And at this point, um, how do I say this? Um, we are not in sync with quite, but discussions continue. So right now, I would say, I would put it this way. What we're dealing with are institutions, not individuals. So just because she's a nice, well-meaning person or seems to be a nice, well-meaning person, the systems are in place. So again, I go back to it. Council member Nado got the mayor to tie the funding to the zoning order. The zoning order is structured and the zoning process and order 
to cut off the ability of residents to negotiate their position, right? So of all the institutions to negotiate with, the zoning commission is the least flexible. And our city council and the mayor, rather than deal with the residents directly and the housing authority deal with the residents directly, tied it through the zoning commission in part to tie hands. And this is why the zoning commission ruling is going to be so important. Then I'll also say that Wednesday there was a meeting of the commission, the zoning commission uh, for the housing authority. I'm not the zoning commission, but the housing authority board of commissioners. So two things we know from that meeting. One, the resident commissioner commissioners terms expired and there's no representation for residents on the zoning commission, I mean, on the uh, housing authority commission. They allowed it to elapse. When they asked Director Donald about it, she said, I don't know nothing about that boss. I don't know nothing, I don't know nothing. Two, there's another um, new communities, Lincoln Heights, right? So Lincoln Heights is another new community they have some units that were built, replacement units that were built for their residents, right? We found out yesterday that 77 residents applied for those units. Only nine qualified after going through the process. The other thing we found out is that 19 families were rejected from those units because they were deemed to be over income even though weeks before the housing authority told those same families that they qualified, they later got a letter saying they don't qualify because they're over income. They're over income because the housing authority helped the members of those families get jobs, right? So they got jobs. When they got the jobs, they made too much money and now they are losing their right to move into the new housing. And the director doesn't know anything about that either. Right. In the meantime, they took those units that the people from Lincoln Heights should have a right to move into, sent letters out to the residents of Park Morton to ask them, do you want to move into these Lincoln Heights units? Right. But if you do, you lose your right to return to Park Morton. So, and the director didn't know anything about that either. So, this is war, this is a game that they're playing and making promises. So, um, so we'll see. So if the new director is about something new and we have a new chair of the board as well, if they're about it, you'll find out in the next two weeks. But if they don't settle this in the next two weeks, it's the same old, same old. So it doesn't matter how nice you are if you still keep the knife in my back. William, I'm going to have Chris Otten go ahead and make his comment, and then we're going to move into um, the next slides. Reggie, I see your hand. You'll be first for the next round of discussion. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, quickly. Hi, everybody. Um, part of what we're kind of contending with is extracting this information, and that's kind of been hidden behind the walls of like these commissions like DCHA or zoning and getting it out into the public, right? Because otherwise, that's kind of partly why these things exist. They're kind of, they're shields for the politicians. They're shields for the real officials that are ultimately making the decision. So extracting this data out into press releases and supporter updates is so important. And I encourage everybody in their own campaigns, whatever they're doing to do that. Um, uh, and one, and that gets to uh, what's got, going on with Park Morton and Bruce Monroe. I put a link in the chat and I encourage you all to extract on your own. If you click through to that link uh, and go to view full log and paginate to some of the last pages there, you'll see the exhibits uh, by which this Bruce Monroe Park Morton PUD is being re-examined by the Zoning Commission. And <clears throat> I hate to say this, but yeah, Brenda Donald, Tyrone Garrett, uh, Adrian, Adrian, uh, I forgot her name, Adrian uh, Thompson, I think it was. Todd. Adrian who? 
Todman. Todman. Who's number, all, now number are, two at HUD. Yeah. I mean, they're all the same privatization movement, right? And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to privatize all this public land. And just like that movement to privatize the land, now the victories we've seen with the comp plan about racial equity, they're allowing private interests, in this case, Holland and Knight, if you go to, if you go to that log and, and look at the exhibits from Holland and Knight especially, they, the, the zoning commission, DCHA, the office of planning is basically allowing Holland and Knight to set the scope and guidelines of what racial equity means in this city. <laughs> and this is the case that they're kind of doing it with. And so there's two things to that. One, Holland and Knight is saying that, well, racial equity means when no race matters, like it's not an issue for any race. So mixed income communities and, and the same old status quo condos are racially equitable because it's not supposed to matter. Race isn't supposed to matter, even though they don't look at who's being displaced. So that's a big thing there. And that's going to be what William's saying is part of this decision on Wednesday. The zoning commission is going to have to read through that bullshit. But bottom line is we have to uh, extract out what happens from behind this wall of the zoning commission and get it in front of Phil Mendelson, who said, oh, it's up to the zoning commission now to implement the racial equity lens. Because if their decision Wednesday allows Holland and Knight to actually set the boundaries of what racial equity means, but really um, it's, it, all the work we've done will, will be for naught. I also just, uh, the other point is, um, on uh, Tuesday, the record closes for the comp plan maps. And I think that's something else that we can do. I think maybe we could follow up later, but basically ask people to write in letters that no more zoning decisions should be made until a truly racial equity toolkit is established by the people for the zoning commission to use, not let Holland and Knight determine it, the people and our discussion should be determining it. I mean, they've had since May, they passed the comp plan in May and they still don't have a toolkit to the point where they're letting Holland and Knight determine what racial equity means now in November. And so we're, we're kind of like, it's an opportunity to go to the council and, and get Phil and everybody involved and have the council, the real politicians say, that's what- interrupt you because we're going to talk more about those action steps in a little bit. Um, so okay. hold some of that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, have Renee share with us some research she did um, about what New York and Seattle are doing. I'm going to pull up your slides. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Renee and um, member of uh, a DC Grassroots Planning Coalition Steering Committee. What I found in looking, I looked at New York law and I looked New York City's law and I looked at Seattle's law. New York City's law that becomes effective next year applies to big zoning changes. And it would apply to some place like Park Morton, Barry Farm. And it requires a public database where anyone can access the, access the details of the, um, economic data, the quality of life indicators, uh, the housing security information. So they, they require the applicant to show all of these things at the outset, because what happened in New York City, there were, uh, there were a lot of zoning changes um, under Bloomberg, and they, they made, <clears throat> excuse me, they made pronouncements is gonna help people, no one's gonna be displaced, but for one of the developments, thousands of Latino residents were the displaced, um, about 13,000. And then um, for another development, thousands of Black people were displaced. So the, for, for great zoning changes, the applicant has to show all of these uh, indicators, the demographics, who's going to be affected, the displacement risk index. Uh, and give data for over time for the prior two decades. So you can't just say, oh yeah, this looks good, but what has been the trend in, in this part of Brooklyn? Uh, and the trend is to push out uh, black and Latino people and we've got to change that. And so um, it also says that the 
the applicants have to show affirmatively that they adhere to the federal affirmatively furthering how uh, fair housing uh, requirements. Now the affirmatively furthering fair housing requirements are a rule. Um, now it's an interim final rule. It was a rule, but Trump um, ignored it and now it's coming back into force. And that, re that has certain things that the federal government wants to see if you're getting housing, um, if you're getting housing uh, funding. And that would be to identify the fair housing priorities for your project and the goals, and then what meaningful actions you're gonna to take to meet those goals and remedy any identified issues. They put it in the New York law. So even though a recipient under HUD doesn't, is not um, legally mandated to do that, it's really the, the, the assistance that HUD will give those projects, New York law is making that a mandate for any of uh, uh, big uh, zoning changes and big developments. So now it doesn't have, the New York law doesn't have a private right of action uh, for individuals, but because of this affirmatively furthering uh, fair housing, it may be able, uh, uh, individuals may be able to set up a, um, a lawsuit um, if the Fair Housing, Federal Fair Housing Act requirements have not been, been uh, adhered to. And so the, with New York City, they, they recognized explicitly that the problem had been that the city was requiring big zoning changes to do environmental quality studies, but that there was no mechanism to see, and they would say, oh yeah, everything's gonna be fine, but there was no mechanism to show that no, this is not continuing the same, the same old, same old. So the New York law has requirements and it seems a little different than the guide so far from um, the racial equity office, which says, consider these actions, consider these questions. Um, it basically say you 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 should do this. You have to do this. Um, and secondly, I think the Seattle um, the Seattle um, Washington plan they've been going since 2015 and 16 because they have the equitable development. Um, they have um, excuse me equitable development growth and equity report that they issued, but they also have. Um, and an equitable development implementation plan. And what I like about their plan is they recognize that the comprehensive plan is the city's principal policy uh, and planning document, but you need an equivalent management tool to structure, to implement the, uh, comprehensively what is needed. And so it has, it, had, it's a sta it establishes a um, risk, um, risk displacement risk index, and it also establishes a um, index for get the, the name of it access to opportunity uh, index, and so it requires that any possible problems be mitigated before you move forward. And so I think that I think that's really the main thing. They recognize that it has to be, the project has to be right from conception. And there has to be a, a community engagement strategy uh, from the beginning. And that people talk about what the problems are in their community, how they've been pushed out, how they've been starved for services in public institutions and those things mitigated up front. So I think the city of Seattle recognizes that you can't have just a good saying we're for racial equity, um, but you have to have a really something in practice um, and, and oversight, continuing oversight. And that's why um, the Seattle, Washington and the New York uh, city policies are, are are seem to have more teeth for action 
and really centering the, the voices of community people in what will be the plan going forward. That's a quick wrap up, go ahead. Thank you so much, Renee, that's really helpful. And you know, I think uh, as you were talking, I was reflecting on th these policies are probably not just in their comprehensive plan. They're probably legislation that was passed that we have to look at it um, more closely. But I think part of the issue that we're having is that the comprehensive plan, even though it is legislation, is regarded by the council and the mayor's office as guidance. Yeah. And we need to have additional policies that are, you know, spelling out more in detail, I think, the um, who's responsible and the, um, you know, the, the timeline of action in, in more detail. So um, I was going to share also that Montgomery County has started doing uh, similar work. I haven't had a chance to look at it in full, but just a quick uh, snapshot that um, they also have a master planning, uh, racial equity requirement in master planning. Here's some of the, the types of tools that they talk about implementing um, and some of the questions uh, that they ask in, in their analysis. So we will do a little more uh, work to, to look at how things are playing out. But it, it does appear that in all of these cases, this is relatively new. As Renee stated, the New York bill hasn't been implemented yet. It's, it's just been passed. Um, so we are, you know, uh, all of the cities I think are, are still um, are still learning. <laughs> and uh, what we, what we wanna do is figure out what we want, right? So that we're not just um, waiting for implementation, but that we're proposing something that uh, then at least they have to respond to if not adopt itself. So here's some of the ideas that we've talked about um, and I wanna open it up from here for some discussion. So we think that there needs to be an, a, a halt, a freeze on planned unit developments and other zoning changes, zoning map changes until this ra racial equity approach is implemented. So until we figure this out, we shouldn't be uh, you know, approving uh, Park Morton, et cetera. Um, and also the, the process being the key, you know, um, of course the outcome is, is important, but if we don't have get the process right, um, we're not gonna get the right outcome. So the, um, the process of, of community engagement and really community decision-making, which we talked about before, um, which involves a level of co-creation with the impacted community. So this is not just about, hey, we, we went and you know, had a meeting but we actually met people where they're at. We talked to them, we took the time to design a process with them and uh, co-creating with them the process so that it could actually reflect you know, the types of outcomes that the community is looking for. Um, we do need to create some indices or measurement tools um, to, to actually honestly reflect past harms and uh, create standards for uh, measuring impact. You remember in the comp plan, there was a lot of um, false narrative around what has caused displacement, things like that, right? There was a lot of false narrative, uh, not, no honesty about the, the policies that the city has promoted that really displaced people. Um, we, we think ultimately that each zoning uh, or land use change at the zoning commission has to be evaluated with a racial equity impact assessment. But I don't believe we think that the office of planning is capable of doing that because they are so politically connected. And perhaps we need to look at an, a more independent entity like the auditor or somebody like that to be playing a role in this. Because again, the office of planning comes under the mayor's office and the office of planning has a, has a history of not going against you know, whatever the mayor's goals are. And then figuring out how do we build in a requirement for restitution and reparations for those who've been historically harmed and currently harmed. Um, and within that, recognizing that that requires decision-making power and material resources through ownership or equity structures uh, for low-income black and brown residents. So the Park Morton equity plan being a great example of um, what you know, we would be calling for. So this is just to, to start a conversation. I'm gonna go with uh, Reggie first, because he had his hand up earlier and then 
if you have uh, comments or questions, either raise your hand or put it in the chat. Go ahead, Reggie. Yeah, so first I kind of wanted to address that question about uh, now Director Donald. This is the same woman who has separated uh, Black children from their families as head as of the Child and Family Service Administration. This is the same woman who in around 2014 or 2015 as Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services had detrimental comments about encampment residents. So I just want to under, want people to understand that. Um, and I, I like what's here. And, you know, one, one of the things that uh, we emphasize at uh, People for Fairness Coalition is that um, we also would like to see a basic universal right for housing um, in the District of Columbia. And this is why we uh, support a lot of these policies coming out, talking about displacement, talking about, uh, you know, Black home ownership, talking about Black economic development that is truly transformative and having, you know, those impact residents as leaders um, in these conversations. And so we continue to uh, support um, the efforts of the DC Grassroots Planning Coalition. And we also, um, you know, are emphasizing housing should be a human right here in the District of Columbia for everybody earning 40,000 or less. Thanks, Reggie. Uh, William, I see your hand up. William? Okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, two things. Um, one is, as we look at the, so projects that get city funding, city land and et cetera, I think is a slightly different path from projects that are so-called private sector projects, because I think in the flow of those city resources, we can attach certain things. So I know some years ago, there was work on the disposition process and things like that, that we need to make sure that racial equity process is um, built into, into that process. The other thing is when the city does put money into a private sector project, the requirement is that the project not be fundable by the banks. So the developer has to submit a failed project in order to get the city's money. So it just means that in that there's some leverage. Unfortunately, a lot of it is with DENPED's office can make that decision um, whether to put that money in, but I think that's where it needs to go. The other thing is there was an email exchange some time ago where the office of the attorney general was saying that in this new fiscal year, they were gonna split off, I guess, resident kind of support from their responsibility to support the agency, agencies. So I don't know, did we get any, did that actually occur in the legislation where they have like a consumer, consumer protection group who doesn't have to take the position of agencies? Yeah, there is some update. I'm gonna be meeting with them uh, before the end of the month. So we'll have a little more information. Maybe we can have them speak um at our next meeting to talk about what that will look like but yeah they will be playing evidently a new role uh, with land use um than than before um renee i see your hand you're on mute <laughs> okay uh thank you i have three points to make um one is that when you talk about historical um, data, that, that was a good thing about the New York law because it requires the inclusion of, of, of looking at these categories that it, that it sets out for the prior two decades so that you can see the trends over time. Um, and so I thought that was really important. And secondly, Seattle, Require had the Seattle Office of the City Auditor um, uses the racial equity, race and social justice toolkit. That's part of uh, 
the Seattle auditors um, mission. So I think that's really important and we can push, push that uh, just based on what, you know, another big city has done. Um, and, you know, and I think without really talking about the racial equity, the Office of the Inspector General really set out a racial equity failure with respect to the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, when they issued their um, the report on, on the Housing Reduction Trust Fund. And thirdly, one thing that was powerful, I thought, in New York City that really showed people they looked at, see, New York City has an um, Office of the Public Advocate, and he was the one that introduced the New York City law. And so he's independent of the, of the you know, he has some independence. Um, but one, one thing that one, a community group did, they did showed how um, what the city government said about some projects and really what happened. And it, it was um, the, the study was called um, Zoning and Racialized Displacement in New York City. Um, and it was prepared by Churches United for Fair Housing. And they showed, you know, they talked about what was said about the, rent of the uh, zoning changes in, um, uh, in Williamsburg, Greensport and Williamsburg, I, th I think there's sections of the Brooklyn or Bronx, and also in Park Slope and showing how, um, you know, they had, so, they had a lot of growth, but 15,000 Latinx residents were removed from Greenport and, and Williamsburg. That, that's so substantial. And in Park Slope, again, they said, you know, they got many more people but the decrease in black people was like five, 5,000. So it's really that, I think we could do that with some, I mean, we could do that with uh, the, the Washington uh, nationals, you know, the, the renovation of the Navy yard or the, you know, just a one project like the Wren showing what did not happen. And uh, I wonder, you know, there's a, somebody on the call today who's a, uh, a university professor, researcher, who's done um, some work documenting some displacement. Tanya Golash Boza is on the call. So um, that reminded me of you, Tanya, when she was speaking. I don't know if you have any reflection on a good way to, uh, that we, if we're going to call for reports like that, that document uh, the real truth of um, the forces of displacement, if, if you have any recommendations. Oh, not to no, call you, thank you. Tanya. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's fine. Thank you. I've been listening and learning so much. Um, I'll just point to two things that I've noticed um, when thinking about housing in DC. And um, it's more like uh, framings as opposed to uh, direct proposals. But first of all, um, it seems like when we have either Hope Six or New Communities or whatever they want to call it, the the projects tend to take two pathways. And I think if we think about, if we compare Navy Yard to Capitol View, you see two very different pathways, but um, race is a key factor. So Navy Yard just involved the complete demolition of a neighborhood replacement with almost all new residents. Um, and then you see economic growth and development and all kinds of amenities. And then if you look at Capitol View, Capitol View involved the demolition of, um, a, a large housing project, but then um, the people that moved in were primarily black, slightly higher income because it was um, affordable housing, but then there's been no commercial development in Capital View. So it just seems like, and, and, I, was, and I was thinking about this as y'all were talking about Park Morton, because it seems like um, it's impossible for the city to, um, redevelop or improve an area in ways that actually benefit black people um, it, it consistently. So something to keep in mind as we think about what happens to Park Morton, is it possible to keep um, black residents in the area and have um, infrastructural and commercial improvements? So that's one side of it. The other thing I've been thinking about is just there's a, there's a fundamental structural problem that's not, gonna, that's not really being talked about. It's sort of like the um, elephant in the room. 
But if you build affordable housing and say, okay, um, you know, 20% is for people of this, you know, percentage of AMI and 30% for this percentage, those plans never, ever, ever add up to 100%. So even, so I think that's the push that needs to happen is like um, people need housing. And insofar as employers in DC are still paying people $15 an hour, those people need to be able to live somewhere, right? So I think just pushing for um, thinking about what racial equity would really look like in terms and, and keeping and, and pushing back against this narrative that like black people don't like nice things. Um, and then secondly, just keep it in mind the broader. So those are sort of more reflections and directly addressing it, but that's what I've been thinking about lately. Anya, yeah, the, the second point around the lack of, you know, adequately building the housing that's affordable to the majority of Black residents in the city, um, that was something that we um, raised in the comp plan. You know, the comprehensive plan had, had this phrase affordable housing, but that means nothing these days. <laughs> and they added now a phrase, uh, deeply affordable housing, which they defined as up to 40% of the area median income which is more on par with the median income for black families in the city. And they claim that, you know, that deeply affordable housing will become a, more of a priority. But as we've seen, that hasn't happened so far. It won't happen unless we push for it. And it's another thing that um, this group has thought about is really a campaign, uh, right? A, really a campaign around um, building the housing that is needed uh, for the lowest income people in the city. So, you know, we saw that the, the failure to spend the trust fund money um, on the lower income. We see continuously land, land deals, public land deals where we're not building the 30% AMI housing. We're seeing public housing redevelopment where we're not fully replacing or expanding 30% AMI housing in those deals. So it's systematically the city has has like decided we're no we're not going to build for that income you know it's a continuation of what we've seen over the last uh, several decades i'm going to um try to get some voices we haven't heard yet so i see ann's uh, hand i'm going to call on ann and then i want to ask somebody from ward three housing justice to share um uh, some comments based on your conversations with office of planning recently as well Ann, go ahead it's, it's a question. Uh, I believe that DC Housing Authority is not required to have racial equity anything. And I, I think we ought to fix that, but um, I guess we have to, I, I don't know what has to happen. Am I right? Probably are right, Anne, um, because DCHA is independent. I'm not sure <laughs> if even the training that is being required um, uh, would apply. So let's double check that. Um, although they are applying it to the zoning, which is also independent. So um, let's let's you and I uh, look into that further, and, and we can con we can outreach to Amber Hewitt and, and get some clarification. But that's a very good point. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, Michael, I see your hand. I'm gonna ask you to be brief because I do wanna hear some other voices. Go ahead, Michael Pan. Okay, I'll be very brief because when you mentioned and and what I, what I discussed in the chat, I mentioned about uh, cash reparations. So when you said uh, this is redistribution of decision making power and require restitution reparations, are you talking about reparations as a program and or as a cast? Because I think that cash reparations We'll do. We'll have a more powerful effect among African Americans because with capitalists, the only way you can't, the only way you can defeat them is hurt them in the pocketbook, take money away from the capitalists, they become less powerful. Two, uh, to stem the tide against uh, the projects. To behold, I figured that the solution is creating creating black-owned businesses in the in the area in in the ward to stem, you know, to stem the projects from happening. I'm not saying that it won't it won't stop for it, but at least it reduced the effects of it. So that way when black businesses for when black businesses are creating DC and employ their own people, they won't you won't see these two main developers trying to trying to like take over DC or trying to replace them. Just like what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in nineteen oh one. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, I think we need to um we need to flesh out the idea more. I did see I have to find the reference again a um 
a policy passed by some jurisdiction in the country recently where they're providing specifically housing money, financial restitution um, for people to become homeowners who have historically been harmed by racist lending practices and, and, and racial redlining. Um, you know, so I, I believe like we have to get to the point where we look at it as a whole, you know, everybody who's been harmed and, not, and, and in that case, they, they said um, it was for people who could demonstrate that they had lived in that city during this particular era where the, the, the racial redlining and racist policies were, were most, um, you know, affecting people. I think in the case of public housing, we can be really clear that the people who reside and are most directly impacted need to be compensated. Or, and that's a great opportunity. I see as, a, as an opportunity for us to repair harm by, by focusing on investing in the, the families in public housing. Margaret, you, um, oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to move on to the next. So uh, is there somebody from Ward 3 Housing Justice, maybe Margaret, um, who would like to share? If so, you can unmute. Hi, yes, I'm happy to um, update everyone. We had a, a meeting, uh, Ward 3 Housing Justice uh, met, that's Nancy McWood, who's here on the call, and Jamie Epstein, I'm not sure if she's here, and I, uh, on behalf of Ward 3 Housing Justice, met with the Office of Planning to talk about um, meaningfully changing the process for planning efforts and redevelopment in Ward 3 in keeping with the new um, policies in the comp plan. And of course, uh, primary among them is the racial equity lens. And we talked to them about um, our major ask on that for them, which is that uh, community involvement be redefined because in Ward 3, there has been systematic displacement um, and exclusion for decades of black and brown people and so to, um, to go forward planning new developments or redevelopments in Rock Creek West using only existing residents um, just uh, replicates the harm that's been done and pushes it forward. Uh, and so what we've been asking for is that uh, planning efforts include on a systematic basis and in a meaningful way from the very beginning uh, impacted community members who might conceivably choose to live in Rock Creek West in, uh, in housing that is being created. So um, what, they, what OP said back to us, which I thought was pretty interesting, is maybe we should check with our, uh, our allies at Empower, since they know we're an, an affiliate of Empower. And uh, and see what Empower had to say about how they would recommend that that happen. So, you know, on the one hand, it's their job and they're being paid to do it. Uh, on the other hand, they're not really doing it in any meaningful way. And, you know, I guess it's on the third hand, you know, it, uh, maybe this, this body collectively would come up with something better than OP would. And maybe we ought to take them up on that. Like I look at this screen about what we're calling for. Um, this is these are good first steps, and then uh, develop some kind of a mechanism so that, for example, on this small area plan in Chevy Chase, they're just having the pop-ups and community involvement things in Chevy Chase. Like they're just talking to the same folks. So that needs to change if we're going to make any change happen in the ward. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Margaret. And what, while you were talking, it made me think about the opportunity to do descendant research and actually reach the people who have been displaced from Ward 3 uh, or their families, you know, their lineage, um, because I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the community that's where, um, you know, by Wilson High School, right? Fort that Reno. Was, yeah, Fort Reno. Reno that City. Was, that was a Black community and displaced, and that's in Ward 3. So you know, it's it's not as though, so I guess what I'm saying is tapping into the history may be a good start, you know, and yes, people from across the city um, who've been, um, you know, prevented from coming into Ward 3 because of the housing costs and, and other policies can be invited in as well, but wouldn't it be interesting 
to reach out to descendants of Fort Reno residents and say, hey, how do we repair it? Let's start with that. How do we how do we repair that harm? You know, because that was a that was a um that type of uh you know land theft that um requires uh reparations. Um I want to go into some next steps and and still continue to uh, welcome comments and questions. But here's what we're thinking in terms of, of what to do next. So we want to put together a uh, action alert um, where we will ask people to send emails, um, tweet at the council mayor and the zoning commission. And I think right now the um, the ask is to halt the the PUDs and the um, zoning cases until the racial equity lens is implemented. Basically saying, hey, you said we we're going to change things. We haven't changed things. You can't just no business as usual, no building as usual. We need to um, get this right. Um, and then I guess we should uh, figure out, you know, either we're going to put forth our own model or what, what the steps are that we want to um, get to that implementation. There's, of course, opportunities for solidarity with the impacted communities, particularly Park Morton. Um, coming up here and, and maybe William can tell us if letters of support or a presence at a hearing or anything would be helpful at this point. Um, and then we're thinking about this is a this is our I, I idea, which is new territory it would be for us to actually propose a zoning text amendment um, that would uh, outline implementation of the racial equity lens. And, and in doing so, it does a couple things. One, it starts the it starts that conversation. So we're not waiting for them to do something. We're proposing something, which is going to force them to respond one way or another. Two, it gives us a, a vehicle to do outreach around the city and engage people in, you know, uh, get ANC support because the uh, text amendment does require if it was a citywide um it has citywide effect, we would have to give notification to all the ANCs, et cetera, but it would give us a chance to have something that we can go out and talk to people about, build support around, and maybe be a vehicle um, to, to put this in motion. I think we have identified, however, that this won't be the only thing, right, for implementation that we have to look at a number of other things uh, that were mentioned, the, the constitution of the zoning commission itself. There's a lot of reform, I think, that needs to happen of the zoning commission itself. Um, who is doing the racial equity analysis <laughs> that, you know, that the challenges of this being held in the office planning um, and, and other aspects that we need uh, council legislation to, to, to flesh out more fully. Um, but this is, this is an idea that we have to, to kind of push this forward. I'd love to hear any um, reflections. Renee? I wanted to say that um, the director, uh, Dr. Hewitt of the Office of Racial Equity, I think she was taking comments, she's taking comments up to November 15th, I think it is, and that's Monday. She's taking comments on, on the draft racial equity guide. And so um, if we want to weigh in on that, as I say, my thing is that it's, it explains a lot of how to talk, to, you know, get community input and what is racial equity and what is the cake connection between racial equity and community development, but it doesn't seem like it requires the, let's say, Department of Housing and Community Development to do anything before it, it refuses to use the money where the statute requires. I, you know, so maybe I'll just write her to say that, but I just want to let everyone know that the 15th, which is, I think, Monday, is, up, is the time to, is the deadline for her to get take comments for people to send comments to her? Yeah, I'm going to uh, reach out to the office to request more time. I think that you know they indicated that that might be an opportunity as well. So I wouldn't I wouldn't you know feel like you can't say anything if you don't do it Monday. Um, but again, we did have a meeting uh, about that. If you want to look at the YouTube page, um, you can see some of that conversation. And I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to draft some comments. But I agree with you, Renee, that 
if it's if it's just a guide <laughs> we, and it's not a requirement, we've seen where that goes. Uh, Ann Hoffman. Ann Hoffman, did you have a comment? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, two things. One, that guide is just on how to do meaningful community outreach. So it's not the total guide for how the Office of Racial Equity should operate. So it's, we'll have lots more opportunities. But it seems to me what just came out about how do you get meaningful community engagement Ward 3 that's all white um, is very worthwhile to be commented on in our comments to Hewlett's gang. Um, that in a neighborhood where uh, residents of certain races have been excluded, that there ought to be specific outreach outside of the neighborhood or in areas that were pushed out uh, to be sure those voices are heard. So that community is not just the immediate, immediate community, but it's the should be community. Yeah, I agree with that. William, I see your hand. Yeah, so I wanted to make one general comment. You know, one of the issues is what they call resegregation, right? So you've had the past redlining and all those displacements and et cetera, but the active force in city policy is displacement and resegregation. So it's black neighborhoods, they're integrated for a little while, and then they become white neighborhoods. And that's what you're seeing in, in Ward 1. And that's been in many of the reports that the city has written. So the, the dynamics are complicated. We have to be careful about going into history, we have to really do this disaggregation of data and process. So for instance, in Ward 1, white flight actually opened up opportunities in Ward 1 for Black home ownership, right? So we're really in this real dynamic that I think this, the situation is more serious than we think it is, is that we have an environment, a city, where it's almost impossible for black and white residents to live together in a stable situation. And our city policies are driving this. It's creating a dynamic where it's oil and water, where it's nearly impossible. And um, we, and that's gonna play out at the housing authority. So it's just a general comment, but I think we're really in this very serious dynamic and we have to be careful because we're wading into a hornet's nest where we can get caught in our own trap if we just don't do what the racial equity tool is really saying, which is break things down. So I think we really have to push the tool and focus our energy on having a workable tool. And then what happens when you use that tool um, to do that. And then the last comment is on community engagement. You know, I don't know how to say it, but really, you know, in this society, if you don't have equity, your engagement doesn't count, right? So you're not at the table unless you own something, whether it's collectively or individually. And so to have community engagement, but you have no ownership, is, you know, it's like not having a vote. So, you know, I think that reparations issue is something we do need to tackle in DC. Thanks, William. Tanya, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. I wanted to just um, respond briefly to what William said, because it's such an important point. And I'll speak just briefly about Petworth. So Petworth was originally built for white occupancy, but then um, as William said, white flight opened up opportunities for black home ownership in Petworth. But what happened is um, throughout the 1970s and 80s and 90s, 
Petworth, even though like the class status of Petworth really didn't change, like the average income in Petworth, um, you know, controlling for inflation stayed the same between 1950 and 2000. Um, the city systematically disinvested in the neighborhood once it became majority black. So what that meant in Petworth in particular is that home values in Petworth remained stagnant between 1980 and 2000. So if you were a family, most likely 95% you know, of the time African-American buying a, a house in Petworth in 1980, it didn't lead to wealth generation because the value just did not increase. So what we see in Petworth, um, and this is just, I'm using Petworth as an example, but you could talk about many other neighborhoods in DC that were built for whites originally. Um, what we see is that it was only when white people began to return to Petworth that we began to see public and private reinvestment in the neighborhood. And that's kind of going back to what I'm, that's something we have to just keep our eye on because um, it's not just, it's not a question of like individual decisions or choice making or who wants to live where. It's a systematic problem in DC that is being repeated over and over again, which is that the neighborhoods do not see investments in amenities and commercial reinvestments until white people come. And that's that's the problem. And then once that happens, because of, you know, in DC, you, you all probably know, but white people have 81 times the wealth of African-Americans. Uh, once a neighborhood becomes reinvested and there's amenities and coffee shops and there's nice things, it becomes unaffordable to black residents. And I think that's the pattern that um, we need to stop. We need to focus on stopping. Tanya, I, I agree. That's a key. And it's been brought up at a couple meetings. Um, there's absolutely no equity with how the city invests in communities, right? And and things that you'll see, you know, like the, the fact that it took, you know, 20 years for us to get the city to agree to put money in the budget for Ivy City to have a recreation facility while, uh, you know, I think it was Chevy Chase was getting money when the residents barely were like, we don't even really need it. They already had a, you know, facility. Um, and just having some kind of real um, breakdown or, you know, invest, look, a real clear look at, you know, the inequity and how we distribute the resources and make the investments in communities. Um, I keep seeing on Twitter um, some residents, I think it's in Ward 7, that are raising the, the lack of um, maintenance of their recreation site, their playground, and they've been raising it and raising it, and still no action. The city is just not repairing the, the, the playground there, but you'll see in another neighborhood where the repairs will happen quickly. So I, I thank you for raising that. Um, I want to uh, just also invite a couple other uh, opportunities to participate. Um, you know, this group is led by a steering committee. The steering committee is just folks like yourself, uh, some of whom you heard from today, Renee and, and William are on the steering committee, uh, Chris Williams, Chris Otten, Nancy, <laughs> others are on it as well. And right now we're meeting on first and third Mondays um, from two to four, but the, this group is, you know, helping to carry this work forward. So helping to plan the meetings, coordinate testimonies, different things, if this is a role that you're interested in, please do reach out to me so that we can talk more about it. And um, if you can't meet during those times, you know, there is a chance that we could reschedule. So let's just, if I would love to hear, you know, from folks who are interested. Uh, Reggie is on the steering committee as well. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get more capacity with just tracking what's going on. So, you know, you, you all know about the DC register. Um, which is published every Friday at noon and includes all the major announcements about hearings and planning processes and zoning hearings. Um, it would be really helpful to have some volunteers who can just, you know, and maybe we have, if we have more than one volunteer, it doesn't, you don't have to do it every week, but you would on, be on a rotation to, to check the register, pull out the stuff, the announcements that are relevant to this group and, and send it so that we can share it with others. And if we do pursue this zoning text amendment, I think it, again, it would be an opportunity for us to systematically do outreach throughout the, the city through our ANCs. And we've talked about this before, ANCs are one of the you know, key spots in the decision-making process around development. You know, they have standing in the zoning process. Um, they are able to, you know, their, their, their position on development is considered <laughs> and often the zoning commission asks specifically what is the ANC said. And so there's a body there that we need to engage more on these issues. Meg, I see your hand up. You wanna make a comment? 
Yes, I just wanted to congratulate many people who are on this call for the awards that the Committee of 100 conferred on October 27th. I put the link to the, uh, to the show in your uh, chat and uh, we, we uh, awarded uh, the Carmel School, the great work that Parisa and the community have done over 20 years. Uh, to make that a reality, or it's going to be a reality. Um, and then to Park Morton Equity Plan, uh, William and Shante, uh, and then to the DC Grassroots Planning Coalition. And um, I think it's just a really remarkable thing that this group has grown and has been so effective. And um, congratulations. that. Um, okay, so I, I want to, uh, again, if you have, if you're interested in helping with any of the things listed, please um, let me know. I just got one message from somebody at volunteering. Thank you for that. Um, and and um, in the chat, also Nick's comment about, you know, this is an election year. It is a great opportunity for us to raise these issues. So if we can, you know, get our messaging together, um, get it out there, have some candidate forums or you know other types of activities to, to raise this through the election process, I think that would be great. Um, Reggie, I wanna go to some announcements. I know there's an upcoming rally that Reggie's part of organizing. Reggie, you wanna share that information about Wardman or anybody on the Wardman? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I <laughs> I have a lot of roles that I that I play, yes, but but um, we do come out to our next rally under the uh, Wardman Hotel Strategy Group. Um, we uh, are calling on the city and and uh, the proposed new owners um, to you know come out and say what are they going to do with this project. Um, we'll be sending out flyers this week um, and we're calling on the mayor and Carmel for the Warbner Park Hotel, a little bit of context. Um, I don't know if people knew, but there is um, a hotel right off of the uh, uh, Whitley Adams Morgan Metro, which went into chapter 13 uh, bankruptcy uh, sometime during the pandemic. And so this is a great opportunity um, as Margaret shared earlier, um, to have that planning process and have uh, affordable housing here. So we're going to be on Connecticut and Calvert Street um, at one o'clock, and we're going to march to the Wardman Hotel at 2660 Woodley Road Northwest. Why we want this to be done, because we want the Wardman Hotel to be converted to housing and not torn down to build mixed income affordable housing for families. We want to save the green space and include community space for education, recreation, job training, and businesses. And so, you know, we invite all of you to come out on the 20th and uh, and uh, continue the fight for housing. What time? At one o'clock. Is that a Saturday? Yes, next Saturday. Thank you. Um, any other comments, any any other announcements? I, I want to make one announcement, which is that another piece of the comprehensive plan is the it calls for an industrial land use study. And that was actually funded by the city this year. Um, so uh, this is really important to residents who are working with in Ivy City and Brentwood that are heavily industrialized and we have you know major environmental justice issues. If anybody here is also in a community that's impacted by industrial land and the, the pollution sources associated, please let me know um, if you are interested. We, we will be pushing for an environmental justice, you know, racial equity approach to this industrial land use study that was supposed to take place this year as well. Any final announcements? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, yes. Uh, I just want to mention, just want to mention, uh, mention what uh, William said earlier about we had to, that we had to be careful when it comes to addressing uh, white flight, 
white flight mean that it's building up more black home ownerships? And I was just taking that note that uh, to be really careful, I think it's it's sending a wrong message that we have to be careful how we fight how we fight against white flight. We know re research shows that's very clear that when when white people, I'm sorry, when Mazungus, meaning like majority like white people, move to, I mean, move to black neighborhoods. I mean, sure, you have some black some black people become home owners. But at the same time, white flight depreciates the black home ownership, the sale of the property, sale of the home. And it's fr what's frustrating is that majority of black residents shouldn't have to find a white friend as a, as a spouse or even as a partner to sell the house or to or even to sell the house at a reasonable reasonable price. And it's very sad, frustrating uh, due to uh, due to red lighting. And this is where I think, and, and I agree that reparations need to uh, come in. Reparations should not be an issue. Reparations need to be passed immediately. When I say immediately, I mean cash reparations give to black residents. Because when you give money to black residents, you'd be very surprised. They'll tell the council the developers, do not gentrify, do not tear down houses. So it's like what happened, just I mean, this just what happened 400 years ago, because the because the slavery mindset is still there. And we have to take that into consideration. Because all these developers, the council members, and of course, council, council members who are African Americans, yes, they are. But it doesn't mean they represent the black residents of DC. They're doing the dirty work for the white developers to get a check. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate the comment. Um, Commissioner Oliver, glad you're here. You, you have your hand up? Yes, I do. I just wanted to announce that there's going to be a COVID-19 vaccination clinic at the Brentwood Recreation Center this Saturday, which is November the 20th, from noon to 3. The Brentwood Recreation Center is located at 23 11 15th Street Northeast, Washington, D.C., 218. Now, the vaccinations that will be available will be the Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. The Pfizer booster will be available to anyone 65 and older or has an immunocompromised system. And Department of Health is administrating, administering these, these um vaccinations. I just wanted to let you know. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, Reggie, did you have your hand up for announcements? Yes, I had, yes, I had one additional announcement. Um, so uh, through our work with encampments, People for, People for Fairness Coalition, uh, the Housing for All Coalition, which is a coalition of students from Georgetown Law who take up housing issues outside of school and work, um, have convened a uh, screening and I'm placing the link in the chat for registration uh, for a movie screening entitled Street Reporter. It is a uh, documentary that follows myself and a fellow uh, reporter named Sheila White um, as we covered the original closure of the uh, K Street encampment in Northeast. Um, so we're, we're encouraging people to register for the screening and come out. Um, and to see the movie, there'll be a panel discussion afterwards as well. When is it? It is Wednesday, November 17th. And there should be a link here. I can send out the flyer to the listserv if you want. Good. So thanks everybody for being with us today. As you see, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so I hope you will continue to hang with us. Um, I do want to recommend if you were at, if we're not at some of the past meetings to go to youtube.com slash empower dc and look at you know the presentation um when andrew trueblood from the office of planning joined us and, and other meetings um just to to get caught up and yeah we'll be working on you know blowing this up and pushing putting the uh, movement behind uh, getting this implemented uh, meaningfully to make real changes so i just want to thank everybody again for for being here today um feel free to unmute and say goodbye to each other and enjoy the rest of your weekend Hello, oh, goodbye. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Goodbye, nice weekend. Bye. Bye. everybody. Bye. Have a great Bye, weekend. Bye. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great meeting.